Hi everyone, um, we'll get underway now. Thanks for your patience while we're just sorting out some technical issues, which always happens when we're trying to do Zoom. Um, my name is Siobhan Lavelle and I'm a member of the ASHA committee. And I would like to welcome you to tonight's seminar, which is part of the ASHA online seminar series. And this is our final one for the year. Um, I'm on the land of the Darug and Gundungurra people and ASHA acknowledges the traditional owners of country and recognises their continuing connection to lands, waters and communities. Recognising where we stand is but one of many acts acknowledging past injustices and committing to acts of reconciliation. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, to other First Nations peoples on the lands on which we meet this evening and to elders past and present. So we've got a bit of a treat tonight, um, which all of you who have booked will have read the background to this seminar and everyone I'm sure will have noticed the exceedingly witty title, um, which is a bit of a precursor, I hope, for what will, what will follow in this seminar. Um, Andrew Wilson has always had a major interest in historical archeology span and in analyzing either the ad adaptations made by the invaders or the interactions with First Nations peoples. He taught with Judy Birmingham and directed the teaching excavation at Regentville for over a decade. And I would refer you to some very great articles in the Asher Journal if you haven't um, read them for a while. And um, he also co-directed the Central Australia Archaeology Project from 1992 to 1997. He's the Archaeological Collections Registrar at the University of Sydney. And that process is establishing a permanent home for the collections so that they are preserved and made available for further research. So of course, anyone who is an historical archeologist or has an interest in historical archeology span in Australia will be well aware of the name of Judy Birmingham and the absolutely primary roles that she had in the development of historical archeology span and cultural heritage management in Australia. But she was appointed to the University of Sydney based entirely on her credentials in Near Eastern archaeology. Um, so one of the things that has happened with Andrew's work is that the ongoing process of cataloguing the university's archaeological collections has revealed contemporaneous documents that throw a fascinating light on the circumstances of Judy's appointment and identify for the first time some of the issues and um, factors in the creation of the origin of historical archaeology in Australia. So without further ado, welcome to all of you and welcome Andrew and we'll get this underway. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, as Siobhan has just said, I've been for the last three years dealing with the collections at the University of Sydney uh, to ensure that they're preserved. And so the first thing I want to do is um, acknowledge some of the people who have been part of that effort, especially Sonny Fritz and Lucas Congolus, who've been working tirelessly on repacking collections for the last two years, and especially Tona Stevenson, who's the um, School of Humanities School Manager, who really has been relentlessly pushing this project forward. Uh, and of course, uh, Judy herself. It's been a bit like moving from one form of collection storage to another. But it hasn't all been plain sailing and um, some of the material uh, was affected by uh, water penetration into various stores here, and that includes Asher, Asher Records. So um, uh, all of that was remediated professionally and is now uh, back with uh, the remainder of the collections. So tonight we'll be looking mostly at material uh, in Judy's collection. Um, but firstly, we'll look at a series of documents that refer to her appointment to the University of Sydney. So let me introduce you to James Rivers Barrington-Stewart and his wife, 
and colleague, Eve, uh, in 1960, arrangements for the teaching of archaeology at Sydney Uni uh, were strengthened. Stuart was made a, a professor and given the task of building for the first time a full-scale archaeology department at the University of Sydney. In August of that year, he writes to Deputy Vice-Chancellor Christopher Ray, outlining his plans. Uh, he's not um, shy. Um, his aim is to create an outstanding department, the best in the Southern Hemisphere. And he explains that to do this, he must have the backing of good men uh, with no room for charlatanism and everything at the highest possible standard. He points out that it's nonsense to have a Department of Archaeology without a long-term plan for fieldwork. Um, and there's no point in having an academic subject that's divorced from the practical. None of this is all that difficult to disagree with. Um, the problem of accommodation bothers him a lot. And as he says, um, it's a bit like uh, Charing Cross in peak hour. So his solution to this problem was to move the department to a house he'd inherited outside Bathurst, uh, then called Mount Pleasant. Um, and it was at this house that um, Gordon Chard was staying in October 1957, uh, before he left and stayed for a couple of nights at the Carrington Hotel uh, in Katoomba before visiting Govett's Lee. The house is still there, in fact. Uh, he explains that he wants to fill the second vacancy with an expert on Iraq who can also lecture in later Assyrian and Babylonian sculptures and the minor objects. And for this, he wants a really good man, and he's written to Professor Mallowan. And he concludes by saying that he has great ideas for the department, uh, and although there'll be disappointments, uh, he believes he can achieve uh, a great deal in the next 18 years. Unfortunately, uh, he only had 18 months. So at this time, Judy is teaching uh, in and doing contract work in the United Kingdom. Uh, she was born Jean Margaret Anderson uh, in 1931 in Essex. And she read classics at St Andrews. And on a spur of the moment on the journey there, she once told me she never liked her first name, Jean. So she, when asked her name, she said, oh, it's Judy. And she kept Judy for the rest of her life. Although, of course, with her family, she was always Jean. After St Andrews, she studied at the uh, Institute of Archaeology in London. And Max Mulliman was one of her uh, teachers. Uh, and this photo was of her digging at Verulanium, uh, very, very important uh, Roman site. So good to his word, a letter arrives to Max Mallowan and he sends a letter to Judy. Um, I've been blowing your trumpet in Australia, and the sound has reached Jim Stewart. He's looking for a senior lecturer in Near Eastern or Asiatic archaeology. He particularly wants someone for the Iron Age, which is your cup of tea. Um, and you have a good claim to a senior lectureship. This is an issue, but um, Stuart wants to appoint new lecturers at senior level because his brief is to kickstart the department. So he doesn't want to appoint junior people who um, will have to develop their skills and their and their publications. There's a little warning in the letter. Some find him, some believe, uh, find I find him a difficult man. Um, but I'll show you his letter. So Judy replies that she's very much taken with the idea, both from the point of view of the subjects covered 
and the possibility of doing real work, underlined, uh, in the Near East from time to time. And she immediately writes to Stuart, uh, explaining that Malawin has asked, has told her about the vacancy for a West Asian Attic, uh, Asiatic archaeology uh, lecturer. And she explains that she fits the bill with not only with her um, studies, but her original research and her publications. And she says, the post you are advertising sounds indeed uh, attractive, not merely because it's a senior lectureship from uh, right off, but also um, building a new department and the opportunity for field study and excavation, once again, to contribute useful work, uh, obviously in a Near Eastern context. Stuart writes back a little more than a week later with an eight page letter, it seems your qualifications fit the requirements. Um, and he then spends the, the rest of the eight pages talking about himself. Andrew, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but we're not seeing your slides moving on. Are they moving on on your screen? They are. Okay. Um, um, would you be okay if perhaps they could be circulated after this talk? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, although it's going to be... So are they not moving? No, we're still on the title slide. All oh, right. Um, you, might, you, I... might, you might need to reshare your screen. Okay. I'm sorry, everyone, for that. No, no, look, that's, that's fine. Let me uh, see what I can do. Can you share? I think it's important that we just sort this out. So can I move? Yeah, that's working, Andrew. That's great. Ah. We, we, we're seeing it now. Okay. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> um, which uh, means I can't control it. Um, let me just... Mm -hmm. What kind of preview would do? We might be seeing your notes, Andrew. We we had the PowerPoint flicking, but now we seem to have Now you're seeing notes. notes, right, okay. We got the script. Yeah, yeah. Um... So I may have lost the PowerPoint, that's all right. 
Are we back again? Yes, we've got the PowerPoint flicking through now. It's flicking through. Okay. Yeah. Great. My apologies for that. Okay. So we're back with um, Stuart's reply to Judy. You're probably wondering what I'm like personally, people find me difficult. Um, but that's because I have a one track mind. And once people understand that, uh, so you've got a change now? Yes. Yes, okay. So, Stuart doesn't to tolerate fools very gladly, and he doesn't like people to interfere in his departmental business. He's certainly autocratic. I think you've probably picked up on that by now. And he expects her to um, uh, lecture no more than six hours a week, and also to work on the museum catalogues and undertake research either with him in Cyprus or elsewhere depending on her interests. And then he finishes the letter. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pack. I'm writing an article. Um, I'm trying to farm my ewes and arrange ploughing. Just send me your photo and a reply as quickly as possible. I hope you like cats. Apparently the cats at Mount Pleasant were legendary. Now, unbeknownst to Stuart, he has actually encountered Judy earlier. Um, he wrote a rather unfavourable um, review uh, of the Mirtu Pagadi's report. Judy had worked on the excavation and had um, written uh, part of the report, and she's listed as Jay Birmingham, and Stuart obviously assumes that Jay Birmingham must be a man. He then writes to Judy about a month later about the problems with the appointment. Um, he had no trouble getting the selection committee to appoint, to agree, but then the professor of Latin, who's never done any research in his life and doesn't know the meaning of it, intervened. He almost, Stuart almost lost his temper. And then he explains the situation to Judy the Department of Archaeology is not very popular with other departments. We're the only department that have got an international standing and reputation. The mean petty academic minds, made up mainly of English failures and Australian rubbish, just don't like anything that receives greater recognition than the ordinary local sewerage. And he says he's completely baffled because he wants Judy and Vincent McGaw. They're the answer to all his problems and explains that there was certainly uh, there was uh, another applicant that he wrote off with a certain malicious pleasure and hopes that um, Mallowan will have written uh, in support. Mallowan does write support and a couple of weeks later Judy uh, writes to him to thank him and uh, and explaining that the appointments are going forward. He responds and says, I gave you a good write-up and said that I thought you were one who would make a mark in archaeology and would be a distinguished contributor to the subject. He was right, obviously, but not in the way that he was thinking. Um, and he says, all you have to do is do that and make sure I haven't committed perjury. They continue to correspond uh, uh, for many years, but um, Judy's correspondence is not as regular as 
as Malouins. And of course, he sends her off prints, which is what academics used to do um, in the olden days. And on this one from 1971, he writes, um, hoping that this little essay might get a squeak out of you. So let's look then at the situation that Judy's in. Um, what happened to this promising New Eastern specialist? Stuart dies in February 1862 and his vision for the department dies with him. Um, there also dies to some extent an elitist approach to archaeology, at least in Near Eastern archaeology at Sydney. Uh, my colleague Craig Barker's research shows that Stuart actively dissuaded students from studying archaeology because if they didn't have a private income, they would never have a career. So his concept of archaeology is very different to the one uh, we have now. But archaeology generally was also changing. If you look at the history of modern archaeology, the 1860s is often identified as a decade where professional archaeology emerges um, as traditional uh, wealthy practitioners begin to coordinate with museums and you get um, the sort of breakdown of the connoisseurship tradition, which has propelled archaeology up to that, uh, that time. And so a century later in the 1960s, there's another shift or at least a broadening of the focus of archaeology away from exclusively ancient, uh, exclusively the ancient and the other. Um, and an easy way to document this is to look at the creation of historical and industrial societies um, uh, around the world. So first off the rank, incidentally, is New Zealand. The New Zealand Archaeology Association was established in 1955, and in 1966 they broadened their charter to include um, historic sites. So this is the same year that Society for Post-Medieval Archaeology uh, is created in the UK. In 1968, the New South Wales um, National Trust uh, establishes an industrial archaeology committee. And that coincidentally is the same year that the Society for Historical Archaeology in the, in the USA is established. In 1970, the uh, ASHA is established in Australia. And in 1971, Society of Industrial Archaeology is established in the US. The Australian Archaeological Association is established in 1973, as is the Association for Industrial Archaeology in the UK. So what we see here is a real broadening at, on an international scale, especially in the Anglophone uh, network um, of archaeology not just for the ancient and uh, the other. There are two other um, areas where this happens. One is Canada, but it happens in a rather different way. They have a very early historic mo monuments act, but not it doesn't produce very much. And it's only with the conservation and um, uh, re restoration of sites, starting with the Fortress of Lewisburg in 1961, do you actually get any uh, active or much active historical archaeology. The other outlier is South Africa, um, where archaeology is uh, focused very narrowly on the other. And um, it's not until the 1980s that you get um, uh, working historical archaeology in South Africa. So that's the situation. The start date for historical archaeology in Australia has always been somewhat unclear. Most accounts avoid specifics and refer to the decade of the 60s. When Judy was writing the encyclopedia entry in 2006, I thought it was a good opportunity to pin down the precise chronology, but I found it wasn't possible. Faced with the choice of writing around the issue, like most others have, I suggested she adopt a firm date and see what happened. Um, she took up the challenge and settled on the date 1967. Uh, we were wrong. It's now possible to look more closely uh, at the development uh, and the precise chronology of historical archaeology in Australia. 
And we start with John Mulvaney. Uh, who gave a very important lecture in 1965. He played an important role in Australian uh, prehistory and history and historical archaeology, as well as heritage conservation. In 1965, he gives the Crosby Morrison Memorial Lecture to the Royal Society of Victoria. And he discusses Northern Australia and its history and the fact that it hasn't been properly understood. And he makes a plea to historians to leave behind the dreary wastes of colonial records. He discusses, for example, Flinders' uh, comments on the material culture he finds uh, in Northern Australia. And he says, is obviously there's a lot to be found. And he, says, he directs them to humbler sources which might be better um, used to comprehend the human populations involved. And this leads us directly to our first project, which of course is Jim Allen's thesis on Port Essington. That's right. Uh, in John Mulvaney's 25th anniversary lecture on uh, for Asher, he recounts the story. Um, he would found out about the Coburg Peninsula and Port Essington in 1965. And when Jim Allen, who was a Sydney graduate, um, wanted to do a PhD, he suggested Port Essington and clinched the deal. And they spent 17 thrilling days of discovery there in May 1966. So a clear date. Um, Jim finished the thesis in 1966, in 1969, I should say. And he states uh, in the introduction that one of his aims was to assess whether archaeology could actually contribute to Australian colonial history. And then he goes on to explain that the invest that um, the work was begun uh, in total ignorance of historical archaeology elsewhere. And while it's true that the investigation was a pioneering one, I wouldn't recommend to anyone writing any thesis that they introduce it by saying they'd done no preliminary research whatsoever, either on the topic or the techniques. Anyway, he, he did find really interesting and useful um, evidence both of the European occupation and um, indigenous use of the European materials. And he finishes his conclusion by quoting his thesis supervisor's words back at him um, about the dreary waste of colonial records and the importance of humbler sources. So I think he more or less um, redeems himself in the quotation department. Uh, our next case study uh, is um, Fossil Beach Cement Works on the Mornington Peninsula, uh, a study by William Culliken. He was a classic experienced old world archaeologist specialising in Phoenicia and Iran. Uh, and he lectured in Semitic Studies at the University of Melbourne starting in 1960. He was also motivated by community participation and along with a friend who was an architect, John Taylor, uh, he decided to investigate uh, this abandoned cement works on the Mornington Peninsula. In 1965, he founded the Archaeological Society of Victoria with most of its members and those who worked on the site with him uh, drawn from his adult education uh, students. And so they examined this site and interpreted uh, 
and documented uh, the remains. And he presented what is one of the earliest reports. Uh, and he explains in 1972, and explains that the work was done primarily for the satisfaction of the authors. And although it was not a classic site, uh, he hoped that future generations would take an interest in these humble industrial ruins. One of the interesting things is that when this publication arrives at Sydney University, it's um, sent to the engineering library because obviously it's not archaeology. Uh, it's a document about an industry. And that old world concept of what uh, the narrowness of archaeology, of course, continues for a long time. Uh, the next uh, case study is, of course, Irrawang. This was driven by the students at the University of Sydney. Uh, and this article by David Frankel in the Union Recorder explains that it's useful not only um, for technology and aspects of life in early 19th century Australia, but also for training archaeological students. And this is a photo that, of Judy's that has captioned um, David uh, reading from the thoughts of Chairman David uh, to the assembled students uh, during the construction of the shelters on the dig house. Uh, next, we see Wai Belena in, um, starting in 1916, uh, 1969 in response to a request uh, from the local community. Um, and the excavation begins in proper in 1970, and the National Trust uh, uh, plays an important role uh, in supporting the excavation and the conservation of the chapel. And those with keen eyes um, can pick out in this photo, uh, Judy, uh, Val Attenborough, Annie Bickford, I think, and uh, of course, David Frankel's hair. One of the interesting things about the excavation or about the investigation of the site is for the, for the first time, it defines all of the elements uh, surviving or otherwise of the uh, settlement and the, lim the excavation that was undertaken was limited to two cottages only, primarily to help interpret what had already been exposed and already been recovered uh, by uh, the locals in their search for bricks to conserve the chapel. One of the things that interested me was whether as part of this process there was, there was any sense of rivalry or competition between these early researchers. Uh, and going back to John Mulvaney's 19, uh, uh, anniversary uh, lecture, he describes Judy as the founding mother and comments on Vincent McGaw and how both of them managed to leave their baggage behind despite professorial disapproval and work on Australian sites not long after they had arrived in Australia. Uh, the same is true of Bill Culligan and Judy. They guest lectured in each other's courses. Uh, they corresponded frequently. And uh, this letter is an example. Uh, he writes to Judy saying he was clearing up papers and he found a billhead. Uh, and he thought it might be useful for her. And she writes to thank him for a copy of the Irrawane etching, saying that she didn't have a good one at the moment, and this is particularly handy. So these people are not competing with each other. Judy uh, then goes on to start the process of establishing the uh, course in historical archaeology. Uh, and this 1971 article in the Sydney in the um, Sydney University Gazette is um, uh, more or less uh, a kind of manifesto justifying uh, and advocating for the study of historic sites in Australia. And so in 1974, 
the um, first course takes place. Um, uh, and its aims are to study the uh, recent sites and to provide training. But an important point that's made in the course outline is that it's not parochial. Uh, Ian Jack lectures in the first uh, term on Anglo-Saxon archaeology, just to make sure everyone's clear that this is not um, some kind of hick Australian undertaking. And the outline also points out that all of these techniques are useful for archaeology anywhere in the world. Um, of course, it was meant to be a practical course, but it was a bit more practical than intended because uh, on the first lecture day, um, the class was bussed down to Sydney Square to do what amounted to the first uh, recorded, uh, the first urban rescue excavation in Australia, which had, because the remains of the old Sydney burial ground had been found uh, over the, over the pre previous weekend. So let's look quickly then at that chronology. John Mulvaney's lecture in 1965 and the Port Essington research in 1966, along with Fossil Beach, which I had earlier dated to 67, but it seems clear that it did start in 1966. 1967 is Irawang, 1970 Waibalena, 1967, Irawang, and then the Historical Archaeology course in 1974. So that then sent me back into the records, looking at uh, continuing the process of examining them and conserving them. And that turned up this article which came as to me as a complete surprise, um, a letter from Mrs. Vernier of North Sydney commenting on Judy's article in Wednesday's Herald about headstones. And she quotes a headstone from uh, Tasmania to the memory of Edwin Howe, here lies the grief of a fond mother and the blasted expectations of an indulgent father. So, of course, that sent me to the Sydney Morning Herald. And on the 1st of December, an article on the recording of 19th century tombstones by Judy and her archaeology class. They've recorded more than 500 pre-1860 headstones and they interpret them on the basis of changes in fashion and style. So it's not a blank recording exercise, it's actually an exercise in analysis. And the article points out that another team from the Department of Anthropology has been doing similar work. And that's very obviously a very careful duty statement um, acknowledging someone else who's involved. Uh, another um, newspaper article, which is essentially an advertorial, uh, a two-page advertorial for um, uh, Sydney University Archaeology and Anthropology, uh, also carries a discussion of this as well as other um, projects, including uh, Waivalena and Port Essington. And it makes the point that archaeology and anthropology students in 1964 and 1965 carried out these studies uh, as a training technique in the, the process, the standard technique called seriation. And this involves establishing changes in social and economic conditions. Now, anyone who's studied historical archaeology immediately understood uh, where these concepts came from. Uh, they, we, all under, we all know them from uh, Bob Schuyler's uh, 1978 compendium of historical archaeology articles. And 
it's deliberately an attempt to combine all of the early literature, which was often obviously not understood to be historical archaeology or was published in journals other than those related much later to historical archaeology. And of course, in that collection, uh, this article by um, Dietz and Def Lefson on um, the stylistic seriation of colonial cemeteries delivered in May 1964 and published in 1966. Their related paper on the Doppler effect in archaeological, archaeological chronology was delivered in no November 1964 and published later in 1965. So this left me with a major problem. The chronology is wrong. Uh, Judy was, as far as I knew, not reading um, anthropology in 1966. I went to members of the anthropology department and quizzed everyone I could uh, and was not able to find a connection. So, but I continued to work on the, collect on the um, uh, collections and I went back to this collection of papers which Judy had packed up in 1980, which related to um, tombstones. It includes um, the draft of her article, uh, Asher newsletter article on recording 19th century tombstones and other correspondence. And, but it did include uh, a 1965 group of photographs. So when I went through this, I found two very dodgy photocopies. Difficult to read and stamped with Judy's stamp. Uh, but they are not the published papers by Dietz and De Lefferson, but the conference presentation scripts. So the question remained, how did Judy get anthropology conference scripts well before their publication uh, years afterwards in the anthropological literature in the United States? The Doppler effect paper was annotated with three papers by Mervyn Meggett in the anthropology department, listing his own publications on trade and exonomy. So he was interested in these papers because they addressed the same topics that he was researching in New Guinea, and he presumably passed these papers on to Judy. And so it's Mervyn Beggett, in fact, with his interest in anthropology that actually provides the link to the very earliest work in historical archaeology in the United States. So if we go back to our chronology, and revise it. It starts with the Death Lefson and Dietz paper um, delivered in May 1964. And that's followed in the same year by Mervyn Meggett doing seriation with Sydney Headstones with anthropology students. The next year, Judy does the same thing, sorry, in 1966. Judy does the same thing with, um, no, it's 1965, um, with um, uh, the same texts. And their second paper, which is actually the source of these techniques, isn't published until early 1966. 
So that solves the chronological problem. The title of one of my original notes on this research uh, was, what is the trigger? Especially in Judy's case, what was it that made her change her primary focus in archaeology? The answer, answer, it turned out, was the access to historical archaeology provided by Megat, which carries with it the amazing idea that approaches to evidence and research techniques might cross disciplinary boundaries. Who would have thought that such a thing was possible? So the incorrect date in Judy's 2008 encyclopedia entry, 1967, can now indeed be challenged and interestingly, challenged by Judy's own work. First, by Megat's application of Dietz and Deathlevson methodology with anthropology students in 1964. And then she applies the same method with historical, with archeology span students in 1965. And the rest is, as they say, historical archeology. span Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, if anyone has any questions, would you like to pop them in the chat, please? Ooh. Oh, we do have a question there, Andrew. If yes. you go, go back to the photograph, I think it's the um, Y. Valena one, possibly, um, and point Judy out. Okay, that I can do. Um, uh, can you see that? Yeah, it's going backwards. We're not okay. quite, quite back yet. Yeah. All right. Both with Irawang, but not so much with Waibalena, quite often Judy would say to me, oh, you remember, at Waibalena we did this, or at Irawang we always, and I would have to say, Judy, I wasn't there. And her normal response was to say, well, don't be so sensitive about it. Anyway, this is Judy. Uh, on, the, on the left. Uh, and Val Attenborough is standing next to her. And further along that middle row, uh, poking out um, between two people is, I think, Annie, but I'm not sure about that. And directly behind Judy is, as I said, um, the other person who's easy to identify, David Frankel's hair. Ian Stewart has a question for you, Andrew, um, about could you say something more about Megat and Ian suggesting he was US trained? Uh, yes, he was. He's a New Zealander. Um, I mean, obviously, I wanted to keep this as short as necessary. He was a New Zealander. He worked on uh, um, Aboriginal communities in Australia and uh, in New Guinea, but he then went to the United States and uh, about half of his career uh, was was based in the United States. And he uh, he died there 
um, I can't remember the date. But yes, so, so a large part of his career and so a large part of his publications uh, would be um, uh, US based. I've got a question for you, Andrew, which is what what's coming next? Um, what, what are you going to do with this? Uh, well, I shall write it up for the Australasian Journal, of course. Um, uh, but um, it may be that there's more treasures to be found in this um, uh, collection of documents and artefacts. Uh, but um, at the moment, we're actually rather preoccupied with the Near Eastern collection, which is not in a good condition uh, and is very extensive. Right, thank you. Okay, but I mean, if anyone is interested in any of this documentation, it's not all digitised, of course, um, but if there's something you want to follow up, by all means, um, contact me um, and... Uh, I can presumably um, uh, help with things. Okay, everyone, last call for questions. You can raise your hands virtually or you can pop something in the chat. Got a question there, Andrew. I'm not sure uh, if you can. Here it is. Yep. Um, uh, well, in some ways, um, from the from the late '60s, I think um, the anthropology department at Sydney also did um, archaeological work from very early on. Obviously. The, the emphasis uh, in those days was on social anthropology and including, and, and therefore, for whatever reason, um, uh, societies other than one's own, uh, whether they be Pacific or um, Indigenous elsewhere in the world. Uh, and that was the kind of ethos of um, uh, anthropology, but it did include archaeological work from very early on and uh, Richard Wright was appointed uh, to that department in 1970, uh, uh, no 1960-something, not long after Judy in fact, and um, uh, his interest was, uh, his, his research was entirely focused on on archaeology, uh, not, not entirely on um, uh, human uh, remains, but on lots of aspects of Indigenous archaeology, in including rock art. Uh, Pam's question: um, They're they're held in the in the um, in the collections here. For any of you who are familiar with the lower levels of the main quadrangle, uh, it's the um, it's the areas occupied by the Nicholson Museum uh, offices, education department, and conservation lab. The old Nicholson Museum lower gallery is now the archaeological collection store, which forms a part as probably required by contractual obligation to uh, tell you this, um, they form part of the Tom Austin Brown Re um, Archaeological Research Hub. Tom Austin Brown was um, uh, uh, an associate of Richard Wright, uh, who had an interest in archaeology and ended up working with Richard on many of his projects, and he left the largest bequest for any humanities um, uh, institution, uh, or probably 10 or 11, 12 years ago now, and that bequest 
uh, is one of the things that funds um, some of this uh, work. Yes, well, um, if um, uh, that's from Anne McConnell, um, if Dennis Gojak was here, he'd be able to um, explain that there's uh, archaeological interest from really quite early on, uh, including the 19th century. Yeah, it's not a, it's not an area that I'm that I know a great deal. Uh, about, but I mean, this exercise has, has demonstrated to me actually how important it is to understand the history and the development of any discipline that you're involved in, uh, because it makes a great deal of sense about the kinds of things that as students, we simply took for granted as being there and adequate and appropriate and fundamentally timeless because they were on our curricula. Uh, the fact is they're all conditional, they're all contestable, uh, and they all have their own interesting legacy and uh, sources of development and influence. I think we're starting to go a bit um, wider in our topic in the chat. So I might um, bring the seminar to a close now. Um, but thank you very much, Andrew. Um, we could not have had a better person or a better conclusion to this year's seminar series. Um, Ash is very grateful to everyone who has given us their time and their knowledge and shared their expertise with us over the course of 2023. And we do hope to have another exciting and invigorating and interesting seminar series again in 2024. So keep your eyes on your email and um, make sure that when those um, messages come out, you do subscribe so that you can get the tickets. And then as I did today, lose the link and um, forget how, how to join and all sorts of things like that. But um, thank you very much, Andrew. Fantastic to round off the year with you. And um, a topic close to many of our hearts, because as you say, we we sat there, ran around old buildings, got told what to do, and just assumed there was a plan. <laughs> um, but um, great, great to close on this on this note, and um, certainly look forward to seeing the publication of it, and indeed what else might be hiding in the archives. I mean, Judy, Judy's such a significant figure, the founding chair of the National Trust Industrial Archaeology Committee and the chair of it for about 20 years and mm. really trying to do um, advocacy for heritage and, you know, a whole lot of things that were kind of outside her role as, strictly speaking, an academic, but she did it anyway and through force of personality she achieved a great deal. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And Asha wishes you... Happy holidays, um, maybe some time off for everyone, but don't forget to subscribe to the seminar series next year. Thanks very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Andrew.